verge of the plant age. The stone age did not end for lack of stones. And the oil age is going to end long before we run out of oil. And I say for a good reason. Because biomaterials are so much better. But we shouldn't criticize our scientists for not making really good synthetic materials for a simple reason. We didn't have enough time. 200 years of modern chemistry is not enough time to make really good materials, while nature had 3 billion years to develop some of the most amazing materials that we wish we had in our possession. Yet, orthopedic surgeons uh, continue to glue and screw synthetic materials into our body. And I don't think that this is a great idea. Why? Because synthetic materials fail. They fail just like this plastic fork that is not strong enough for its performance. But the real reason why it's not a good idea to introduce synthetic materials into our body is because in nature, things are done differently. In nature, nobody takes my head and screw it into my neck or take my skin and glue it onto my body. In nature, everything is self-assembled. Every living organism, whether it's a plant or a fish or human being, are made of cells, and the cells contain DNA. The DNA encodes for nanobio-building blocks, which many times are proteins. Other times, there are enzymes that make other things like polysaccharides or fatty acids. And the common feature of all these nanobio-building blocks is that they don't need us. They recognize each other and self-assemble into scaffolds on which cells are growing, proliferating, organizing into tissues, and the tissues together organize into organs, and the organs together makes the organism or life. So we at the Hebrew University in my laboratory about 16 years ago decided to focus on probably the most important nanobiomaterial for us, for human beings, which is collagen. Now, why collagen? Because it accounts for about 30% of our dry weight. We have nothing more than collagen in our body except for water. And I'll give you a few examples. Bone is about 50% collagen. Our skin is about 70% collagen. Tendons and ligaments, close to 100% collagen. So I always like to say that anyone who is in the business of replacement parts for human being would like to have collagen. But admittedly, uh, before we even started the research 16 years ago, there were already in the clinic in use more than 1,000 different medical implants made of collagen. You know, simple things like dermal fillers to reduce wrinkles, augment lips, uh, artificial meniscus, bone grafts, and even leaflets of heart valves, all made of collagen. Well, then you should ask me, why did you even bother to start? Well, the reason was that up until recently, all the collagen used in these medical implants, the source was dead bodies, dead pigs, dead cows, and human cadaver. So that's not a very safe source because they all potentially harbor human pathogens. And in fact, the FDA already in 2007 asked the companies and the scientists to start and look for better and safer alternatives. So that's exactly what we did. We cloned all the five human genes from human that are responsible to make collagen in our body, and using genetic engineering, introduced all the five human genes into a single tobacco plant. So now the plant knows how to make human collagen in its leaves. The technology was matured, and today in Israel, we have 25,000 square meters of greenhouses all over the country. The farmers, thank you. The farmers receive these small tobacco plantlets from the company. They look like regular tobacco, except that they contain five human genes. We grow them between 50 to 60 days. We harvest the leaves. The leaves are transported by cooling trucks to the factory, where we start the, ex the, the extraction of the collagen. Now, if you ever made pesto, you know how to make collagen. You crush the leaves, you get the juice, concentrated protein, and then the protein is then purified in clean rooms, and the end result is collagen 
which is identical to what we have in our body, except that it is more safe because plants do not harbor human pathogens. So this is not science fiction. We are, in fact, today, producing replacement parts for human beings in plants. <laughs> Antibodies. Antibodies are guardians of our body. In fact, they're a central part of our immune system. So no wonder that many antibodies became biologic drugs. And these biologic drugs are really excellent drugs, because they're very specific. Take, for example, Umira, which is indicated for rheumatoid arthritis. It's a wonderful drug, except one big problem. The cost of Umira per patient is 35,000 US dollars per year. That's a lot of money. It's $100 a day. So the end result is the only one out of 1,000 people in the world that would like to enjoy Umira can afford it. But the question is, why is it so expensive? Well, the reason is the cost of production. These biologic drugs are produced by mammalian cells in very special and very expensive bioreactors. They're very delicate and they require clean rooms and utilities. And the, the medium we feed them is also extremely expensive, so it's expensive. So we ask ourselves then, why should we produce these antibodies or biologic drugs in such an expensive system? Let's clone the genes of the antibodies and stick it by genetic engineering into a tobacco plant and grow it in the greenhouse at the cost of lettuce or tomato. So that's exactly what we did. So we've been able to cut the cost. We have been able to cut the cost of these antibodies by two orders of magnitude. So not $100 a day, we'll be able to provide for less than $1 a day. So even a farmer that make $8 a day can afford it. Sequoia trees are another beautiful invention of nature. They're extremely strong. They carry hundreds of tons for hundreds of years in cold weather, in hot weather, in UV light. In fact, I'm not familiar with any plastic chair that can survive such harsh conditions. Yet, if you look at the structure of this tree and you ask yourself, what makes it so strong? So it turns out that it's made of nanofibers that are surprisingly made of sugar. Well, not exactly the same sugar we drink in our tea. It's actually a very special kind of sugar called cellulose, and these nanofibers that are made of this sugar are about 10 times stronger than steel. So that's quite amazing, and yet it's made of sugar. So analysts say that nanocellulose is going to be one of the most important nanomaterials for the entire industry. But here's the problem. Say 10 years ago, you wanted to buy half a ton of nanocellulose because you wanted to um, build an airplane or a, a truck. And you could uh, Google, you could eBay, you could even Alibaba. You couldn't find it because there was no commercial source. So back to the lab at the Hebrew University, we decided to develop a cost-effective method to produce nanocellulose, so now we can produce it in multi-tons amounts. So now you have a lot of nanocellulose, what can you do with that? Well, the beauty of nanocellulose is the fact that once you suspend it in water and you apply it on any surface, once the water evaporates, you end up with an extremely strong and transparent film that is an excellent oxygen and oil barrier. So it can easily replace all these plastics and aluminum that pollute our environment. Well, wonders didn't stop in the plant kingdom. In fact, any kingdom gave us some wonderful things like the insect kingdoms. Take, for example, cat fleas. Cat fleas can jump as high as 100 to 200 times their height. This is amazing because it's the equivalent of a person standing in the middle of Manhattan in a single jump, go to the top of the Empire State Building. So you have to admit that it's amazing. 
But the question is how catfish do it. So it turns out that during evolution, they developed this wonderful protein material, which is called resilin. Resilin, in simple words, is the best rubber on Earth. You can stretch it, you can squish it, and once you release it, boom, it brings back all the energy. So everybody would like to have resilin, but to catch cat fleas is not a good idea because they're jumpy. But that's the beauty of technology. All you need to do is catch only one, extract the DNA, and clone the gene that encodes for resilin, and introduce it into a less jumpy organism, like a plant or bacteria. So that's exactly what we did. So now we have a lot of resilin. So what can you do with that? Well, lots of things. Sports shoes for athletes that would like to have better performance. Touch screens for smartphones that are foldable and will not break and many, many more applications. So what's for the future? I believe, I believe that in the future, we will be able to produce almost everything in plants. So not just collagen or resilin, but in fact, everything that nature gave us. And using modern technologies like 3D printing, we will be able even to print a heart. Now, this heart is not gonna be as good as we can get from a donor. It will be better, because we are gonna make it from better materials. So, admittedly, heart is still difficult, but I'd like to share with you that we are today already printing human lung. And this is just the beginning. And I would like to wrap my talk by quoting Pavlov, who once said, if you want a new idea, you should open an old book. And the book was written. It was actually written over three billion years of evolution. And the text is the DNA of life. All we have to do is read this text and start our progress from there. Thank you.